All right, Freddie Lim, co-founder, chief investment officer, Stash Away, thank you for talking to me. I guess this uh, discussion was precipitated by, um, well, I'm an account holder, so full disclosure here. I saw that email from your end telling me that you had re-optimized portfolios to reflect changing economic environments. Then, of course, I had to click through it. Then I saw this article that you wrote, and it was quite a lengthy one. So I thought, what better um, way to get the company to explain what this means for people like me who are unit holders as well as, you know, obviously investors, right? For, for me to just get in touch with you because I can. I've met you many times. Um, we're quite friendly. So I thought it'd be nice for you to come on uh, to the podcast and explain what it is that you're doing with this re-optimization. And I think the first question is, what triggered this decision to re-optimize the portfolios? Because the last time you did it was, I think, three years ago. Oh, no, no, no. In fact, let me just correct myself. You've only done it three times since inception. Yeah, and inception was four years ago. So on to you, uh, Freddie. Thanks. Yes, you're exactly right. This is the fourth time ever uh, since we existed. <clears throat> and um, as you know, our investment framework is based on economic cycles. Uh, as a very core pillar, and then valuations, and and then the uncertainty that we see in the markets. Um, it's all very data-driven, very systematic, and the economic data uh, currently suggests that um, a lot of the numbers are saying uh, on the growth side, the economies have all rebounded strongly. Uh, the only downside is that in the U.S. in particular, inflation momentum is a little bit more on the high side, and I think investors need to start preparing for it. Uh, the good news is the rest of the world, actually the inflation pass through is still very benign. It's very coming off at low base, very manageable. So it's an interesting mix where US more inflationary momentum, global, healthy, no problem, both rebounding and growth. So that opens up a lot of opportunities for growth and also for buying protection against inflation. Yeah, so the previous um, portfolio balance was described as an all-weather one, right? So all-weather one yes. means you don't really know what's happening. Is, is that right? Um, all-weather all means, you know, if, if it goes this way, then you're prepared. If you, if you go that way, you're prepared. Um, this one seems to show that you have a clearer direction on where markets are headed. So, so can you explain what does all-weather mean? What does an inflation-biased portfolio mean? And I guess, um, what is this direction that we're heading into? Well, an old weather strategy was invoked last year in May 2020. Uh, very early on, we did it. And, uh, and even though there was some initial rebound and rescues from central banks and governments in the world, we, we weren't sure about other factors such as uh, currency depreciation, right? When you print a lot of money. In fact, in the last 100 years of money printing, most of the money is printed last year. So there's a lot of other risk factors at play. And hence, we felt that, um, no, we felt the data suggests that the amount of uncertainty is too high to take a very affirmative action. Uh, what we did was to preserve capital, split capitals in four quadrants. So you're prepared for recession, you're prepared for good times, you prepare for good times with high inflation, we're prepared for stagflation, which is rare, seen in the, only in the 70s. We're trying to split money across all four different major economic uh, regimes to make sure our users are stress tested, right? So that was the, 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 the May 2020 uh, situation. But now there's been just, uh, even though we're still in the pandemic, the vaccine drive has really stepped up a lot of stuff. You've seen a lot of rebound activities as well. So that has led us into a growth scenario all the affirmatively. And at the same time, the inflation bias is also affirmative because COVID-19 has caused disruptions to supply chains. Uh, companies find certain part of their processes broken and they have to find near-term alternative, hence prices or costs are rising, right? Those things will take a couple of years to work out or, or when we reopen, it goes away. However, that will take a couple of years. We don't want to take too much chances for our user. We want to make sure we hedge their portfolio. We create insurance adequately for their portfolios. Okay, so you are quite clearly on a growth path and growth path normally is a risk on path, yeah? Where you buy risk, so-called risky assets like equities, and you get out of so-called safe havens like bonds and gold, yeah? 
um, to some extent. And of course, you would hold less cash as well because you're less um, hesitant about the future. The thing is, I've got a couple of pushbacks on that, Freddie. Um, I think the chief of which is um, this whole um, COVID variation theme where there's Delta and then there's Lambda in Peru. There's, you know, there's spikes all over the world. And then the other thing is that um, American stocks, of which stash away is a very high concentration, right? American stocks are at a very, very high level already. They keep on charting new record highs, right? I think the S&P crossed 30,000 a few days ago. And uh, there's people calling for the, um, for, for, for the various indexes to also go higher. But there, there seems to be less room on the upside than there's room on the, on the downside. So are you putting... I, I think uh, I'll address a question into two... I think okay. it's a two-question okay. series here. Okay. Let's address the first one first. Um, the first one, the, your question was... Um, the spikes. Yeah, so you have some disagreement on on, on the variant, right? Well, I, I don't um, know. The thing I don't know. That, you see, because we're, we're, we're stuck in the middle, we don't really know what's happening in terms of... Yeah, the thing is that um, you got to look at the vaccination rates and... Um, you know, in Malaysia is still challenging. Japan is still slow. But as you, if you look at the data, especially in the major economies, U.S. is fantastic. Um, and it's proven that um, the Pfizer combination, the Moderna combination, is very effective at uh, recovery rates, even with the variant, especially with Delta. Um, so, you know, overall, it's a tug of war still. But the vaccination rate, the moment you get it to 75% across most countries, you're going to see very, very big differences and changes in policies. Right now, we're not there, but the market is not going to wait for it. The market looks forward very quickly because the information is public, right? So that's how I view it. And even though you're right, there's all these challenges with the variants, especially the with Delta, right? Um, the, the market looks forward past that and say, wow, I'm going to be at 75% vaccination rate across most population at some point. That really opens things up. So you see REITs start outperforming and they have. Why would they do that? Because investors are looking at something called a sector rotation, right? Out of tech, something more traditional and more heavily affected by the pandemic, which is REITs. Hotels, airlines may be a bit more challenging to really reopen, but REITs is a nice like traffic at the mall People start thinking about it as coming back soon, even though it hasn't really happened. Lots of setbacks, right? Uh, we open, we reopen, we close, but the market looks forward. So that's that's what prompted us to uh, interpret the data this way. I hope that makes sense. Huh? Yeah. I'm agreeing with you, but I'm looking forward. I see. Yeah, well, well I, th I think I think definitely the market is very, very forward-looking. It's, it's a forward-looking indicator as opposed to, say, GDP, which looks backward. Um, so... By correlation, that means if you think that things are going to grow, if you think things are going to be recovering, if you are now much more, um, I, I guess, um, convinced in your in your direction, does that mean returns will also be better? Um, if you are careful with the inflation bet, which is why we do it, because if you don't, because the situation is weird, right? The Pandemic is still around. The COVID disruption, the supply chain is still around. So if you're not careful with your asset allocation, you're not prepared for hedging, you will have your earnings diluted because of inflation. Uh, you've got to be very careful. So that's why you know our portfolio will see a bit more towards energy, a bit more towards consumer staple, which is food, beverages, uh, you know, the more inelastic demand stuff. Things that's more in the eye of the fire for, for inflation, and it's going to be so for a few years. We sort of invested in that in this round. You got to be a bit more uh, sort of. Uh, you got to get into the nuts and bolts, and and to find the right protection. Gold, which 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 we have for like forever, is 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 which is which is a good inflation hedge. But we're drilling down in this reoptimization, meaning we're broadening the inflation protection to places where uh, we we think can offer both growth opportunities and inflation opportunities. So for example, commodity exporting countries are going to do well, right? If this inflation stays and if growth and demand sustain, right, in this period, 
that means Australian equities could turn around. Um, but, you know, like there's, so there's a lot of things that you can do to broaden your portfolio's dimensions. So that's, that is what, exactly what we're trying to do. Uh, we believe in growth. The road is never always going to be smooth. It's always going to be bumpy. So you're always going to buy some protection here and there. And the inflation bit, the risk is getting higher. So we prepare you for it. I mean, the market can still have a correction even in the middle of a, of a recovery. It is very common. So we always want to urge user, review a risk level, always maintain enough protective assets as well. Even though it's growing, it's not like, oh, on 100% going to be stocks, right? We always have to have some mixture, right? It's just pulling different lever to balance the portfolio. Yes, you, if you see what I mean. Yeah, I think that's what you mean by having effective inflation insurance. That's the phrase you use in your article, which I'm quoting from. Um, I, I presume for or for a lot of investors uh, in, in Stash Away, they would have their staple EPF, then they might they might or might not have a property, and then that's then they have their Stash Away. And I think a lot of Stash Away investors are quite young, um, either quite young, fresh graduates, or first five, 10 years, or then there's the kind like me, you know, who are like, still trying their way around. And then there's an, there's an older crowd. I know quite a few of them who have put a substantial amount of money into their into their <coughs> portfolios, right? Um, maybe just give a reflection of your stash away client profile and um, for, for people who are not so diversified, like, you know, for, for other more savvy investors, how do you give them this uh, effective inflation hedge? Sorry, you mean uh, <laughs> we're giving them through the stash away portfolio, I, I presume, right? I presume That's because you're giving the them this place. protection within the portfolio, and you're not allowing them, well, you're presuming they don't have that uh, ability to hedge outside of their stash away. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, you can see that uh, they will get Australian equities and they will get consumer staples in the US. They'll get a bit more energy um, exposure, even though energy exposure will reduce the ESG score slightly because we're just having a little bit of it. Um, we got uh, so overall, you also have a bit of emerging market bonds in there. They still offer higher EU, and they are countries that's very export heavy in terms of commodities, right? So anything that benefits from rise in commodity prices, base metals, food prices, uh, any weather disruption, COVID disruption in supply chains, we want to be invest in those. While at the same time, the rest of the portfolio still focus on long-term growth, right? So, so we are just broadening that inflation portion of it as long as you have the stash away portfolio. Well, I can't do much if you're outside the stash away portfolio. Uh, we can advise, but we can't really act for on your behalf. Uh, but, but actually, uh, our users are most welcome to sort of uh, reach out and chat with our wealth advisory team uh, who, who does we do look at the financial plans of users to try to have a holistic treatment. But of, of course, uh, you know, that's just an advisory. In terms of real actionable thing that we do is what we can do is a stash away portfolio. Yeah. Do you, do you um, optimize your portfolios as a reflection of your client profiles or do you do it anyway as a standard because things are changing? Because obviously, um, not every investor is, is the same, right? And the only thing you know about them yeah, is the, the risk. Their, their risk profile will be different. Yes. Uh, that's a good, very good point. Yeah. And also the goal time, time to their goals. So for example, for the same person, if I have a long-term retirement goal 40 years from now, I have a lot more time. I can yeah. take more risk, right? Because I have time to recover. But if I have a three-year goal, like you know, down payment for a flat, then the algorithm would tend to suggest lower risk even for the same person because you just have less time to, to recover from any surprises. So that algorithm is built in, which is, which is why when you answer the questions, uh, there will be a recommended risk level based on your profile and then based on your goal. Why, what are you investing towards? Uh, of course, if you choose general investing on our platform, it's just your natural risk profile because we, we don't know more of if we have more information, we can draw it down. So um, in this setting, yes, everybody has a different risk profile, whatever the purpose and the person's background. Um, if you want to take risk further than our recommendation, you do need to show more proficiencies in the background when, when it comes to investing. If you want to take risk down, by all means, you're welcome. So really, um, when we always urge user, if you're not comfortable 
with something in your portfolio. Don't think about the tree, but think about a forest. It's because we are packaging the whole forest for long-term potential, right? If you're uncomfortable with something, maybe it's the risk level that you should be adjusting to. Adjusting lower, higher is up to you. You have that choice. Now, every portfolio, even though they are different risk level, they are managed the same way. Meaning, yes, I may have different varying amount of inflation protection I will buy or sell, but it's all a function of what's my risk point, right? The higher risk guy will be always investing more in equities. But in this case, you invest in Australian equities now, in energy equities, small cap, and, and, and even the stapers, but you'll be more equity focused. But the lower risk point will have uh, fixed income, right? But to protect from inflation eroding your purchasing power of your, your fixed income return, you now find that you buy some gold, you buy some inflation linked bonds, maybe global ones rather than US ones. You, you find that you buy very many different things, maybe even emerging market bonds, just to make sure you have something that's sort of uh, ease your 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 battle with inflation, right? So every portfolio will have a different action to to get you the inflation insurance, depending on the risk level. Okay, okay. A, a quick word from you, Freddie, uh, on 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 Asia, right? Asia Pacific seems to be struggling with COVID. Uh, it, it's not recovering as fast as America, um, whereas North America seems to be on a different growth path. Um, how do investors navigate that? Um, there's no other way than diversification. You have to invest in America. You have to invest in Europe. They are reopening faster. Policies are looser. Um, if the risk is they have set back, then they close again, but they are taking a chances earlier than Asian countries. In Asia, we, you also have to stay invested. We have a different growth path, right? Uh, for example, um, even China, even though there's this antitrust measure against tech, it is preparing China for a healthier ecosystem going forward, less kingmakers concentrated in a few hands, level the playing field, more consumer data protection, less leverage in the system, more systemic risk being managed, short-term headwinds, long-term potentials, right? So you always have to say, not every line item in my portfolio will have to do well at all times. Some items may have to fall and I'm buying it every month. I'm dollar cost averaging into it when it's down. That's great opportunities for later, but I can do so because there's other parts of the portfolio that's making money today that offsets it, right? So we think about it as a package. You cannot just say Asia versus US. We got to invest everywhere uh, as much as we can. Uh, I think that's the only free lunch is diversification in finance. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm glad you brought the whole idea of uh, falling because I, this is my question as well, right? Um, China regulatory risks, because you have got a fair proportion of the portfolio in China tech and China big tech, which is kind of hantam now because of the government clamping down the DD and of course, and financial was also postponed. Um, what is your view on China tech in the context of the regulatory risk? And is that still a long-term portfolio holding for your investors? Well, just a qualifier. Um, our holdings in China um, innovation stocks range from 3% of the portfolio for the, for the lowest risk to a maximum of 20% for the highest risk portfolio. And in fact, only one portfolio has 20, the other ones goes to 12 and then below. And I'm talking about the allocations up to July 21st before the latest reoptimization. In the latest is roughly similar. So what it means is that the allocation to China tech itself, we recognize as high potential long-term. We also recognize as a highly volatile asset class. Uh, that's for sure. When things don't go well, it can drop quite substantially. We know that. And that's why it's really meant for higher risk profile for the users. If you are concerned uh, for our users on our platform, if you are concerned about the amount of China tech you have, it's really a question about your risk appetite versus that one. And if you're not comfortable, bring it lower, right? So I just want to bring it back. But in terms of answering the question, um, the headwinds is real. This year, we will see China tech struggle. But you know, the way I think about it is you can't always buy the high, right? Like you said just now in one of your, the second part of the last question, which we did not go into, 
S&P is all time high, I can say the same. It is that you can't always keep buying something that has been doing well recently. At some point, you're going to buy something that's not appreciated by the market so far. You are positioning yourself, you're planting a seed, your next seed for the future returns. Return don't just come from trend following, right? You always have to think about different pockets of return coming from different places. And so China in the long term, and maybe even in the medium term, say five years, if you look at China government's plan, it's still revolving around technological revolution. 5G network is going to be built up because of competition with the West. The U.S.-China trade war is not U.S.-China trade war anymore. It's, US versus the, it's China versus the West, right? We, they no longer can rely on the West for, for parts, chips, for example, supply of parts for their technological industries uh, because of the trade conflict, the tension. And so China will build out its own. And uh, just in semiconductors itself is the same. They're going to build out their own. As an investor, just in these sectors, you now need to think about the whole world ecosystem will be broken into two. One that services China's new aspiration, the other one that services the US, and you go to all the companies who have to find ways to track carefully between the two and not get caught in a cross, uh, crossfire, right? As investors, it's easier because we can invest very diversified manner these days. We're very blessed with technology with fintech platforms that allow you global access. So this is one of the blessings of our generation and we should take advantage of it, right? So I would say that um, the outlook for China uh, tech, medium to long term is phenomenal. Uh, Near term headwinds is real as well at the same time. So it's a matter of having the right amount of exposure to that, that you can hold in your portfolio and be resilient in the long term. Again, going back to your risk level, revisit that, bring it lower. If you think you you really don't, you felt antsy about it, bring it lower, bring your risk lower. If you have a higher risk profile, you probably wouldn't mind 20%, but some people may prefer 7% in, in China tech, right? So really revisit that, look at allocation. It's very easy to do on our platform. Slide the ruler of risk up and down. You see the allocation change. Feel it. Have a thing about it, right? I think you're right, uh, Freddie. A lot of people get stuck. Alibaba the... can go to zero. Tencent correct. can go to zero. <laughs> <laughs> correct. <laughs> correct. Correct. And nor can Didi, Didi Chu Sing is the biggest ride-hailing company in China. How can they go to zero? I think a lot of people, um, they do get stuck at the moment and they do you know, lose sight of the long term. So I, I think you're right, uh, Freddie. It's, it's all about um, long-term diversification. These are the principal rules of investing, right? And Shu Chang, you're right. But then I will go one further to say that single stock investors had it worse. If you invested in the TAL education group or Gautu, you're decimated by 50, 60% within the day on Friday last week. Yeah. Whereas China Tech, the innovation stock did drop as a whole about 9.4% on Friday. But you can see a lot of names in there are decimated by 50, 60, you know, even more. So single stocks investors would be even more in danger. And the diversified approach of using ETFs is that there's this survival of the fittest approach, right? Whoever drops out of the index, the and some new names will come in to rebalance your 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 your, your members. You wouldn't wait for the name to go to zero. In fact, you'll get competed out by some other names. So that means that if these guys are dropping a lot new startups will have a chance of coming in. And these guys are no longer beholden to the kingmakers like Tencent and Alibaba. They are free from that because of antitrust, right? It actually gives you more opportunities. It wouldn't be just 53 names in K-Web anymore one day. Maybe it's going to spiral to 200 names one day because now more medium names, are new up and coming names are free to come in, right? Exactly. Imagine not taking Alibaba's money and be threatened that they will invest in your competitor in China. Imagine that situation in the last few years. That's going away. Yeah, what you say is true. Um, and indexes and their weightages continue to change all the time. Um, Freddie, I, I, fantastic. Thank you for talking to me. I know you're a busy man, so I'm going to let you go. Um, take care and good luck with the investment uh, world. Thank you for talking to me. Thanks for having me. Thank you.